Thank you very, very much, Roseanne, for the great introduction. And thank you all for allowing me the privilege of being here. I'm supposed to be back campaigning in New Hampshire, and I did a major address last night, and I'll be doing one tonight. And I don't think people are going to even know that I left. And it gave me a chance to come out here and meet with some wonderful students this morning, uh, some community leaders this morning as well, and to be here. Um, before I get started, <clears throat> I'd like to just uh, talk to you a little bit about a, a story about some of our friends that got elected. And um, after the election night proceedings, the, uh, the husband and wife went home. They were kind of uh, holding hands and looking up at the sky and just kind of wondering what the next few years would bring for them. They were citizens, former legislators, and you know it was all new to them. They weren't politicians, and they were embarking on, on a brand new challenge. And um, got home and kind of, again, just walked on solid ground, you know, kind of appreciating this big milestone in their life. Went upstairs and checked on the kids. They had three kids. And as they went up the stairs, one of the doors was open. And, their daughter Jennifer was on, their hand, on her hands and knees and saying her prayers. And she was overheard to say, Dear God, God bless my mommy, God bless my daddy, God bless Roscoe, our dog, God bless my brothers and my sisters, and God, this is a terrible day for me. We're going to have to leave you now. We're going to Washington. <laughs> and uh, in many ways, that's a true story. <laughs> um, I uh, am a businessman. I've got 34, 35 years of business background experience. I spent 17 years with the DuPont Company prior to 1976, and I ran the Xerox Antifreeze business. Um, I came up to New Hampshire through an ad in the Wall Street Journal, believe it or not. We bought a place called the Christmas Farm Inn. It's in the White Mountains, about 60 miles south of the Canadian border, a very successful country inn. We have two other little businesses that we're selling to our youngest son and his wife. We've been married for 36 years, and our oldest son's a veterinarian. Uh, and he has a child and his wife, and our middle son, Mike, is a Marine. He's an infantry officer, and our youngest son, Will, is our business partner. So when you put it all, all said and done, the most important thing that I could possibly be doing is uh, taking credit for and working with my wife and our family for what we've had uh, and what New Hampshire's been blessing us with. Um, as a small businessman, I've come to the process in Washington, D.C., and I said it earlier this morning, the best part of my week is being able to come home on a Saturday night and then uh, have dinner, put, put a pair of jeans on and a sweatshirt and a pair of boots, have dinner at our inn, and the next morning go to church and then walk around our property, because I think this is kind of what puts me um, solidly on the ground and gives me the strength to go back down to Washington the following week. But it also gives me the, the common sense that you need to deal with some of the major issues that we deal with. And that's what A to Z is all about. And again, I'm going to ask, are there any bank bankers in the room? <laughs> There's one banker back there? Just one. Would you come up here, sir? <laughs> That's, that's great. Come on up. Huh? Rod, um, I'll tell you, you're a great guy. Come on around here. Rod, you're a great guy. You're a great American. I'm not the only banker here, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some sand, yeah, some sandbaggers out there. Oh, yes. Well, we're just going to have a little fun here. Uh, you're my banker now, and uh, I'm coming to you for a loan. You got it? Yes. Now, um, <laughs> you, you've had people come to you for loans before. This is a good deal. This is a great deal. I just want to tell you that, that our debt this year is about $200 billion. Now, plus or minus a billion or two, all right? It gets better. It gets better. <laughs> Or it gets worse, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> our, our debt is four point, our total debt, you know, you know where I'm coming from. Yes. $4.7 trillion. And you know, we just had this deficit re reduction program, and the results of that, we're going to have another trillion to our debt in the next five years. So we'll be at $6 trillion in five years. Now, stay with me. The interest on the debt is $212 billion. That's this year. 
in the year 2002 will be 272 billion. You excited yet? <laughs> now here's the question. I'm getting less excited. Here's the, <laughs> here's the question, and, and this is an important one. In the year 2012, we will be, in terms of our resources, only able to pay the interest on our debt, which you as a banker would be happy to hear, and pay all the cost of entitlements. But we're not going to have any money to run our defense or the electric lights or pay for the buildings, the rent, the DEA, the FBI, and all that kind of stuff. And that's, why, that's where you come in. We'd like to borrow some more money uh, to fund the rest of the, so we want to keep this thing going. Now, what do you think? Well, it sounds like a very difficult loan. <laughs> <laughs> what is it uh, now? Go ahead. We don't make loans that long. You don't? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, the two of us in this little skit, we're going to get some of you folks in here. Now, what do you all think about that, that little deal? I mean, that, that, those are the facts. <laughs> uh, anybody think there's a better idea than borrow more money? What do you think? Quit spending it? Great idea? How many think it's a great idea to stop spending so much money? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> How about, what do you think, a balanced budget amendment? Anybody think that's a good idea? Take a little work? Reasonable. Reasonable? Line item veto? Not bad? Penny Kasich, penny on the dollar, 95 billion, you know, didn't quite get through, missed by five votes. What else can we do? Mr. Banker? Well, Refinance the I guess I, I'm thinking of all the collateral that you would have to put up, but I can't see that. Uh, I think you could come back to us in about five years. All Maybe right. if, you, if you accomplish everything you're saying So you're, you're saying kind now. of blowing me off, huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> how about, who do we have, let's see if we can get, is there a corporate CEO in the room? Corporate, anybody? Yeah, right there, Bill Harris. Bill Harris. Bill. Come on. Bill, good man. I, I need a lot of support, Bill. <laughs> okay, let's get a small business. How about one corporate guy? We got a corporate guy. Anybody? Charlie, you'll do. <laughs> now, in, in corporate America, what's this downsizing thing we've been talking about? We read it all over. Small businesses, big business, downsizing, cutting back, getting rid of waste and inefficiency. Isn't that a good idea? Good idea. Small business? Small business. Makes sense? Yes. If you had the same problem we had, what would you do? I wouldn't loan you the money. You wouldn't <laughs> loan me the money. John? I'd try to borrow some more money. To keep it going? Yeah, to keep it going. <laughs> Now he's just being contrary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Charlie. You're great. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. I don't know about those other bankers in the room, but we got a great one over here. Thanks. <laughs> well, with that in mind, when we had the chance to look at voting for the economic plan that was going to raise taxes, but technically reduce the debt. I didn't really agree with that concept, and what I tried to do is figure out what is it we could do to make this thing work in the event that that passed. And so on Friday afternoon, I called Rob Andrews, who is a conservative Democrat from New Jersey, because I knew whatever I did, it had to be bipartisan. We had to make this thing work on both sides of the aisle. And I said, Rob, I had this crazy idea. You have a few minutes before you leave for New Jersey. So we got together, and. We talked about it, and he agreed. And we made this commitment that we've worked on for over a year and we'll continue to work on for another year. And really what it is is saying that we asked for 10 days of debate on cutting spending, a national debate. Can you imagine the ser most serious problem we have facing the future of our country, having 10 days to discuss it and debate it in full view of the cameras? That's what we asked for. So we decided, well, we'll write a letter to Speaker Foley and he obviously is going to see the wisdom of this great idea from a Republican and a Democrat. I mean, he'd jump at it just like that in a New York minute. Well, we didn't hear, and we didn't hear, and we didn't hear, and months went by. We had 234 people co-sign the letter, and then four or five months went by, and we 
decided to drop a bill in the hopper, along with a rule, to uh, show them how serious our intentions were. We now have 230 people that co-sponsored that bill. Well, eight months went by, didn't hear a word, <laughs> and we kind of kind of bottled up in in uh, in committee. You know, the way it works is the leadership they don't want something to come to the floor, just doesn't get assigned, doesn't get out, and the committee chairman work with it. And so this was an idea that was kind of history. Well. We have a thing called the discharge petition. And a discharge petition is a thing that will force it out on the floor for discussion and, and, and debate. And that's basically what we had to resort to. We had uh, up to about the first day, we went over 100 names in the discharge petition. Now, you really have to agree that if you're going to have 230 people that will co-sponsor a bill, you would think that 230 people would sign a discharge petition. How many people think that that would be a, a normal transition of, of events? Yes? Right. Guess what? Didn't work that way. <laughs> uh, there were some people, believe it or not, that I can't believe it, but some people that actually co-sponsored the bill that had no intentions of seeing the bill come to the floor and did not want to sign the discharge petition. So we got up to 177, and then it kind of looked like it was getting serious. People were starting to get real nervous. We got up to 204, and boy, they got real nervous. And uh, so what happened was is that David Bonier, who is the whip on the other side, make, made a statement through the Wall Street Journal and basically said that if anybody on their side signs the discharge petition beyond the 204, that their committee assignments would be in jeopardy. And then the appropriations chairman said to both sides of the aisle, if anybody signs on at that point, both Republican or Democrat, that their projects would be put in jeopardy. Now, I don't know, does that sound like a threat? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we're locked in at 204 in this session. It hasn't gone anywhere for two or three months. Um, I have to tell you, and I don't think he'd mind, Jimmy Traficant's from Ohio, isn't he? He's a Democrat. Well, I went over and I said, Jimmy, you know, buy America. This is the best thing you could do to buy America. How about being on my discharge petition? You know what he said? He'd be number 218. And I give him credit for this. He said, Billy, I will give up my committee chairmanship and all the things that go with it to see that A to Z passes, but I don't want to give it up if, it doesn't, if it's not going to make it through. So he says, give me the ball, calls me chairman, give me the ball on the one-yard line and let me go in for the touchdown. And I said, that sounds good. So we really only need 13. But that's as far as we've gotten. And uh, Rob Andrews and I recommitted a, a week ago come back out and do it all over again. That means we've got to start signing up the process and go through the whole thing, and we're going to keep doing it until we win. Uh, we feel so strong that this is such a major issue. And you know, we're not the only ones that think so. Um, Christian Coalition, Americans for Tax Reform, uh, Association of Concerned Taxpayers, National Taxpayers Union, Citizens Against Government Waste, I don't know how many people are involved with that. You can get some mailings, a whole bunch of mailings on that. United We Stand America, United We Stand is actively going out and getting pledges signed from people who are running for Congress. Um, Americans for a Sound Economy, National Chamber of Commerce, National Federation of Independent Business, Free the Eagle, American Conservative Union, American Legislative Exchange Council, Americans for a Balanced Budget. A whole bunch of people think that this thing will work, and we think it will too. Now, what we're really, the, the, the actual bill, instead of 10 days, we say 56 hours. And the way that it will work, uh, and the way we're asking it to work, is let's talk about entitlements first. In other words, let's look at, at and if you look back at some charts, uh, in 1963, a third of our spending in this country is on entitlements. Presently, at 1993, 1994, it's two thirds. And what's driving our deficit is the entitlement area. So at some point, that's where we need to start. We need to start entitlements first. Discretionary, yes. We do need to look at the helium program since 1925 that is, absolutely has no useful purpose that could save a billion dollars. Uh, we need to look at that. But the key to this is, is to have a full debate, an open rule, an up and down discussion, an up or down vote. And then finally what we do in the, in the genius behind A to Z, and, and this is going to really get you, unlike many other areas where you see savings in the government, Instead of recycling it into new federal programs, what this will do in one fell swoop 
we will do a final bill that will take catch all the savings and it'll go right to the deficit. Now, I, you know, on the, on the vote, when we canceled the super collider, how many people think that the savings in the super collider went to the deficit reduction? It didn't. It went to spending new federal programs, and that's the problem, and that's why we have to get to the core of the issue. The, um, I don't think people realize, like in other legislative bodies, uh, we are in a situation where 83 percent of the stuff that we address, 83 percent of the bills that we address are addressed with closed rules. Now, when closed rules, you know, when you have representative democracy, you have an open rule which gives you a chance to make an amendment. You have a full debate, an up or down discussion, an up or down vote. Well, that's not what, it, that's actually not what actually happens. The whole process is controlled by a handful of people in the House leadership, five or six people. They are prospered in the past by keeping a, a tight lid around the throat of Congress, loosening and tightening their grip, depending on the issue and the politics of the moment. They control what bills go to the floor for a vote. They control whether a bill gets to the floor. They control whether an amendment takes place or not. And they can also control who offers the amendments. They control the whole process. And each year, the abuse of that control has become more and more offensive and oppressive. Now, why do leaders want to keep that control? Well, control is power. And to many, the work of Congress isn't about people anymore. It's about power. Why does the membership of Congress put up with such a power game? Well, because people who control the power and the process also control what committees each member will serve on and what projects will get funded in each individual's district and a lot of other factors that make or break you as an effective representative. If you're a Republican, it's expected that you'll buck the system once in a while. I'm bucking the system. The deck is stacked against you anywhere, so what have you got to lose? What about Rod, An Rod Andrew Andrews from New Jersey? He's bucking the system big time. What is it he's going to lose? But if you're, you know, if you dare to buck the leadership on something like controlling the process, you may just find yourself sitting out there on a desk in the tarmac at, in Washington's National Airport. So if we assume that Congress has to deal with some pretty tough politicians, and some tough rules, should we care and should we fight the system? And in my judgment, if we care about getting the pork and the waste out of the special projects that Congress squanders billions of dollars on taxes every year on, we have to somehow come up with a process that eliminates that and changes the focus and the priorities. That's what I came up with A to Z. This idea may be open, or I believe, will open up Congress in basic reform that has been a decade or two in coming but hasn't come as yet. Congressional spending is at the heart of the fight of A to Z. Right now, most spending bills come to the membership in big bundles. They start with some critical item that no one dares to vote against, like earthquake relief or small business assistance or something else that's truly worthy. And then they load up the bill with the pet projects. Let me just take Los Angeles earthquake relief, $8.6 billion about six or eight months ago. You probably think that all $8.6 billion went to the victims of that earthquake, right? How many people think that there was a pure bill? Not many. Well, the problem is, and, and you know, it's sad that in the state of Maine, it also funded a potato fungus research project. Uh, in New York City, it added a project in North and South Carolina, it added projects. In Hawaii, it added a sugarcane project. And that's what's sad. That's why I voted against it. But what else did it do? It also didn't fund it. It funded about a half of it, and then it left the future generation a half. Now, I don't know. What do you think about that? I mean, it's like, isn't it like going out to dinner in a way and not paying your bill? I mean, it's crazy. We don't have to do it that way. Uh, Unfortunately, while we're talking about the earthquake aid, all these little things get slipped into it. And uh, it, it just, it just is, it's crazy. So if you're a part of the power elite, you can use tax dollars to basically buy votes in Congress. And when the bill comes to the floor for debate, everybody talks about the earthquake relief, but nobody talks about all the little things in there that have nothing to do with earthquakes. 
and the rules say that we can't cut out the extra spending because you have a closed rule and you can't make an amendment to pull that out of the bill. So one vote on the whole package, up or down, in my judgment, that is not representative democracy. A to Z would change that system. A to Z says that, again, as I mentioned earlier, we would do 56 hours of debate, the rules would be suspended, and any member could bring up spending cuts program on their own for a debate and a vote. If the program is justified, the vote to cut it would fail because it would win on the merits of the case. If it wasn't justified, the program would lose, and that would also be based on the merits or the lack of merits in the case. But for any program that can't stand on the merit or in the light of day, it gets reduced and it gets eliminated. And again, the helium reserve would be an example of that. That's how to start to make real funding cuts. That's how to start cutting the budget. You don't just whittle around the edges and in my judgment, uh, we, we've got to somehow uh, come to grips with it. The leadership will tell us, no, your idea is preposterous, it won't work, it's a circus. Well, the worst circus that I've ever had an experience with is in 1991 at 4.30 in the morning on voice vote, we passed $55 billion to bail out RTC and FDIC. $55 billion on a voice vote, no accountability, Hardly anybody was there, it was at 4.30 in the morning, and I think that is absolutely a circus. In my judgment, A to Z is like a small business, like our little skit up here, small business or a small town meeting, a small town meeting that we could have in New Hampshire. Take any family in America that is strapped for money and has pressure with their bills. What do they do? They spread their bills and their expenses out on the kitchen table, they look at their checkbook, and they figure out what they can pay and what they have to cut back. They set their priorities. They look at their expenses one at a time because it's simple and it works. It's a way to do it. It's all there is to A to Z spending cuts plan, frankly, my friends. Take up one spending item at a time. It's like a line item veto. There's 1,200 programs. We're only saying let's review maybe about 70 of them. Figure out what we can afford to spend and where we need to cut. Debate it in the open vote it in the open, make each member accountable. It's called common sense. After all the cutting is done, then we have one vote to take all the savings and put it to the deficit. In my judgment, if our $200 billion deficit for this year is a problem, and it is, then we ought to have that debate and see if we can't cut $200 billion from the deficit and start living within our means. So since we agree that A to Z is a good idea and we know that it will do some good, well, we could all say, well, it should pass, shouldn't it? Well, I've just told you that it didn't, and we're gonna come back out again this coming year, and it will eventually, it will pass. A to Z was never allowed to come for a vote. They didn't dare, because they knew it would pass. They use the same rules that A to Z will change to avoid A to Z for the moment, and that's where we are. The, uh, I think that in the, in the sessions that we've had with the students this morning, we talked about can we, with the small amount of time that we have, the narrow window of opportunity, can we make some major changes in the way we are looking at the future of our country and can we actually get things in our spending in control? There's an opportunity here and I think the only way that we're gonna be able to do it is that we're gonna have to change a mindset. A change of mindset from our point of view and how we deal with things and change our mindset and how you deal and look at things. What will be your responsibility as a citizen? And how can you affect the process? Wouldn't you like to be a part of that process? The internal tools of congressional reform can do a great deal to make the process of assigning priorities and crafting a budget which would be much more open and honest and fair. But determining what kind of Congress we will have, what will be their values, and what will be their priorities has to be a partnership. It's not realistic to expect the electorate to think one way and the Congress it elects to think another. So I'd also like to emphasize how critical the attitudes of the citizens themselves will be. People in communities just like you who are here today are at the heart of the goal of reforming Congress. One of the biggest central problems we face in forcing Congress to confront its irresponsible spending is that members of Congress believe that they can be heroes back home if they come home with that fat check or that new research center or that downtown revitalization project. 
They daydream about tossing the symbolic shovel of dirt and cutting the ribbon while news cameras capture the moment. Bringing home the bacon is considered a good thing, as though bacon sometimes just wasn't another pork product. It all depends on who gets to serve it up. I think it's asking too much to expect congressmen and congresswomen to stop wanting to bring home federal spending projects as long as the local citizens applaud every time a check gets presented. But what if citizens all over America were just as suspicious, just as skeptical of federal spending projects in their hometown as they are of projects in some other states across the country? I happen to think that such a change in local attitudes would have an immediate dramatic impact on the way members of Congress do their business. Suppose, let's say, that the next time Senator Robert Byrd brought home another federal agency, uh, you know what his goal is, don't you? <laughs> well, there won't be another Washington, D.C. He's going to move the entire U.S. Capitol to West Virginia, one building at a time. That's his goal. You laugh, but, you know, he's doing it. The people of West Virginia, what would happen if the people of West Virginia demanded to see the, the, the objective analysis that showed why this move was absolutely justified? Wouldn't it be incredible if he was put on the defensive? And suppose that if there was no such justification, if this was just a clever maneuver or a power play by the senator to grab a little more extra cash for the folks back home, suppose that the people of West Virginia would respond with resentment and outrage because they were just as concerned about wasteful spending in their towns as they were about spending it in Ohio, New Hampshire, Mexico or South Carolina, because a piece of every single dollar in federal spending they recognize comes from their own pockets. Suppose that the local newspapers would condemn Robert Byrd for conspiring to spend unwarranted federal funds, and in local editorials they demanded that the building not be built at all, and that the money be returned and go directly to shrinking the budget or reducing the deficit. What do you think? Wouldn't that be neat? It would be different. Basically, what would happen if the people of America pledged that they would not put up with waste or needless spending anywhere, and least of all, where they could see it firsthand in their own backyards? That would be a formidable force in reform. If the people of America were united to take up this cause, I think it would become the strongest weapon in the country to fight waste. It is this kind of partnership between the people and the congressmen and congresswomen is to work though it has to apply to those groups who derive benefits from federal spending. They would be expected to pledge themselves as individuals, and these are many, many of these people are very much against our A to Z idea, that they would not immediately protest a review of federal spending programs that might in effect impact them. The principle is the same for federal spending on people as it is for spending on things. If the spending is clearly appropriate, if the spending is cost-effective and just, then that's fine. If a proposal fails such a test, we ought to condemn those who back it and always be toughest on the things we see in our own backyard. Now, that's a little different from the way we've been doing it. A population which maintains universal skepticism on federal spending that insists on objective accountability, which reserves its most intense scrutiny for the spending it can see firsthand, could turn congressional attitudes upside down in a year. I know there's a sense of ho a healthy dose of idealism in this concept, but I think it's important that we recognize that the role of each of us has to play if we truly want to reform our government. And I say ours, yours and mine. New Hampshire, unfortunately or fortunately, my opponent tells me, unfortunately, I say fortunately, is the last state in the country in terms of federal dollars received back. And in New Hampshire, I believe strongly that low taxes come from low spending and we ought to have less government, not more government. And I'm proud of the fact that we are the lowest state in the country and I want to make sure we continue to stay low because we don't want to send our money out of state. We want to keep it in our local and, town, local and city and town government. Not in the government, but in our own, own pockets. And what little we give to lo local governments, we can be more effective closer to home and the further we get away, the less we come back with a factor of one to one. I can tell you that in New Hampshire, I was proud in 1993 when we had storm relief from the federal government, which I couldn't believe. 
from major snowstorms were in the business of snowstorms to town sent their checks back and i was very proud of them i'm a grandfather of two and a father of three and i'm very concerned about the future of our country i strongly believe that we must change gears and we have an opportunity to do it we need to change the priorities from spending to cutting spending and you need to change your priorities on what you're expecting from your representatives in terms of how you receive what they bring back. If we can accomplish those two things, I think we can get on the road for accountability in government. I believe that balanced budget amendment will do some good, and I believe a line item veto will be, do some good. But we've got to somehow start running this thing as if it's our own money. And we've got to stop thinking that it's somebody else is paying the cost of government because, it, in fact, it is our government. And I think we also have to take a responsibility for the people that are coming behind us, the next generation, the people who we are currently stewards for, who we are going to affect their standard of living. Uh, be happy to answer any questions and, and, uh, and, and take any, uh, any thoughts you might have. Comment is, uh, it's absolutely inaccurate. The focus on the bill and the rule is on entitlements. We do entitlements first. There's only one way that we're going to solve this problem. We've got to start with entitlements. And, uh, you know, we've got to, we've got to start, take a look at uh, benefits for illegal aliens. Now, the first question is, is why are they here in the first place if they're illegal? Second place is why are we giving them a host of benefits? Some cases better than some benefits that we provide for ourselves. 26% of the, of the prisoners in our federal prisons, 26 of the prisoners in our federal prisons are illegal aliens, receiving better standard of living than the, from the countries, where, than the countries where, where they came from. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. On Medicare, we ought to consider taking a look at, just talking about, Finally, talking about should we have means testing for Medicare? People who make $75,000 a year, should they pay more in Part B premium than somebody can hardly put food on a table? My answer would be yes, but let's just talk about the debate. We can't keep going the way we are. The crime bill was a crime. In 1988, we had $2.5 billion. We just spent $30.2 billion. We were weak on the crime effort, and we were really strong on the welfare effort doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yes, sir. Well, you're putting pressure on me now, you know. <laughs> I'm going to tell, I'm just going to say, and I'll give you exactly what he said. He's, he's an appropriator, you know, and, and the appropriators together, let me just restate, because Obi, who was the chairman, has told all the appropriators that if anybody signs on, that's going to affect their work in the committee and their assignment in the committee and their projects. And so um, I just have to, you know, Ralph was one of the appropriators. And, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's protection of turf. The appropriators appropriate, and they don't want A to Z. And, and Ralph, let me just say, I have a lot of respect for him. And on this particular issue, I'd love to have him on board. Jimmy Trafficant, good guy, you know, I'm glad to be the number 218, you know. But why doesn't Tom Foley get on with it? Why, I mean, here's a guy, we just talked, Dr. Benz and I were talking at lunch, you know, because he'd been out there, and, and, and certainly there's been a transformation, I think, it's fair to say. Uh, maybe all of us, unfortunately, I mean, one of the things I try to do is not catch the Beltway fever by coming home every weekend and walking my property and looking at the things that I need to protect and preserve. And uh, maybe, maybe Tom Foley's got to walk his property once in a while back in Washington. Uh, but I think he's off base on this. He, should, he ought to engulf this thing. Instead of saying it's a circus, instead of saying we ought to recycle for new federal dollars and new federal programs, if you were listening to the people, I'm sure Spokane, Washington is no different than this group here. There are people everywhere in, the, in America that are saying, guys, you're on the wrong track. Isn't anybody listening? And so we need to get everybody to listen. Yes, back. Okay. Let me just talk about the question was, what about the 
economic uh, or what about the uh, contract for America the Republicans signed? And uh, what this is, is a, is a contract of telling people what we would do in the first 100 days, uh, what would the priorities be, where do we stand, and, and, and a commitment to, frankly, bring it up for discussion and a vote, things that we've been talking about for a long time. Things like a balanced budget amendment, line item veto, capital gains reduction, term limits, uh, things of that nature. Now, just because you sign the contract doesn't mean, I mean, the devil's in the details on some of this. There's not going to be complete 100% agreement by everybody that signed it that everything in that contract needs to be moved forward. But what needs to be moved forward is let's have a debate and a discussion on these things that we keep talking about. Let's Let's instead of just talk the talk, let's walk the walk, and let's bring it to conclusion. Let's everybody take a position on it. And I think what we need to do more and more is, and I need to have a contract with the people in New Hampshire, and you need to have a contract with people that represent you, what do they stand for? What do I stand for? What is it that I'm going to do? And I ought to be able to tell you that and then stick up for it and, and, and fight for it. And I ought to have the courage of my convictions. And if I tell you balanced budget amendment here, that means that I don't go down on the floor of the House and change my vote and vote against it. That's all that contract's saying is, is let's have a debate. Let's talk about what will move or not move America forward. Let me see if I heard you. Why can't the media shed some light on this pork that's, that gets added on the bill? Well, I don't think the media, frankly, <clears throat> does its homework. Uh, if they did, they wouldn't allow, I mean, they, they, they would emphasize, you've got to realize we have a liberal media. And, and, then, and, and, you know, not, I mean, George Will, I wouldn't call liberal. I mean, you can find some exceptions. But you've got to come out, I mean, that thing should be blasted high and wide. It should be blasted on two reasons. One is half the bill was loaded with pork, and the other part of it was that it wasn't funded. But I think, again, we as individuals and citizens, we need to have the revolution. And I'll tell you who I think the real revolution where it's coming is these guys right here. These two right here and all the scholars and all the young people in this room. Because we are cheating them out of the same opportunities that we have had. And time is growing short. OK. Uh, you mean the lobbying reform? OK. Um, I signed on to the lobbying reform, and I held my nose. Um, the, 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 it was a terrible, bad piece of legislation, and I hope it gets, it, it gets cleaned up. First of all, uh, in my judgment, the fact that I accepted a meal here does not, isn't going to buy me one way or the other for any, any particular proposal that might be coming. If I'm asked to be a speaker at a, at a convention, as I was last night and as I will be tonight. Um, that's not going to do it for me. Um, however, perception is so bad of members of Congress. Anybody think that there's any profession lower than a member of Congress? <laughs> I mean, anybody got one? <laughs> and so we have to do something different. And in my book, personally, um, I'm going to hold myself at a higher level of, of accountability. When it comes to finance reform, well, a couple, a couple other problems with it, and then I want to talk about finance reform. Um, who's going to be controlling the lobbying? Who's going to administer the lobbying bill? Guess what? The administration. I mean, you think that's fair, to, to have it all go there? And secondly, you got fines of up to $200,000 on lobbyists and no fines for members of Congress that should go to jail if they violate the law? It's, it's a sham. It's wrong. But you know, the sad thing is, we've got, to have, we've got to have major changes. In the finance reform bill, do you think it's a good ans answer to, to finance, to change our reform system, for example, um, to put $200 million in public finance of a campaigns instead of raising money? I mean, that doesn't make sense. We don't have those resources. But I would support, and, and frankly, take a look at PACs. You have PACs like uh, National Restaurant Association, uh, NFIB, National Federation of Independent Business, a bunch of small people like my business, my little business, I supported both of those so I could get my, my point of view, my position to the table in Concord and Washington. I couldn't do that as a businessman. I didn't have the time or the money. But they would, for, they would represent me at the table. And frankly, you know, when you come to the table, 
Uh, in, in my book, you need the small guys, the little guys, and I, I would say if you want to reform it, bring it down to the same level as individuals. But don't cut out the little guys because then you won't get that viewpoint. And the bottom line is if you look at my voting record, and I talked to a few people, I'll get you one second, uh, you know how I'm going to vote. I have a track record of four years. I have a philosophy. I have a conservative philosophy. You know that I'm going to vote a certain way 99% of the time. And it's not going to change. What we want is e honest people with integrity and character in Congress to represent us. And the Ross of uh, and those kind of people, uh, we hopefully we're going to be able to weed out. Yeah, well, your, your point's well taken. And uh, we do have term limits. Um, you know, the key is, is that uh, you, you have a situation where people say, you know, well, if you're not doing a job, we'll vote you out. But what about the Ross Minkowskis? And what about people that have been there? And, and you know, the sad thing, we go back to the thing that we talked about earlier. My challenge to you as individuals and citizens and taxpayers, you know, instead of the new helicopter that was brought in to pay off the city of Chicago, if the people of Chicago said, we don't want it, that's the beginning of the revolution. That's when it starts to make sense. That's the real term limits. When people say, no, I don't like the way you're doing business. I don't want it that way. I don't want the freebies and the handouts because I know I'm going to pay for it. That's where you have real term limits in my book. OK? All right, Bill, thank you thank very, you very much. much.